I don't think you can really say, well, we need to see more of this or more of this. I think we need to see more of our sin, but more of the gospel. And as we see more of the gospel in Christ, we'll see more of our sin. And it'll just be a constant rebounding to one another. Um, and that's in inescapable. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Today I have a very special guest, Mark Jones. He wrote a book called Knowing Sin, Seeing a Neglected Doctrine Through the Eyes of the Puritans. And it's an appropriate topic to, to discuss because it's Easter this weekend, praise God. And uh, Jesus died for our sins and rose on the third day so we could have everlasting life, which is amazing. So we're going to talk about sin today all the whole doctrine of sin and, and all of its aspects. So it's going to, it's fascinating. This book is very fascinating. Um, I just got back from Colorado Springs the other day and I spoke at a church there, which was really great. Uh, and then my last standard reason conference is in Augusta, Georgia on April 22nd and 23rd. And so I don't know if it's sold out or not, but if you guys are in the area and you want to come, technically it's for high school and junior, junior high school students, but adults I think can come too. So uh, just go to sdr.org and you can sign up for that. And uh, just as a reminder, we're on Patreon and you can subscribe monthly to the show as little as $5 a month. And it really helps us keep the show on, keep the lights on. So I, uh, we all appreciate that very much. Thank you guys. And, um, so let's, without further ado, please welcome Mark Jones. Welcome, Mark. Great. Great to be here with you, Beckett. And so tell us just a little bit about your background. I, uh, well, I was born in South Africa, but I have British parents. So that's, um, the, uh, explanation for the bland South African name, but, uh, we moved to Canada when I was about uh, eight and I've lived in the UK, the US, actually, in Wisconsin, and went to university there. Became a Christian uh, at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, while I was playing soccer for their um, team, and uh, knew I wanted to become a pastor. And so I went back to South Africa eventually to study, and then up to the Netherlands to Leiden and finish there. And I've been the pastor at Faith Reformed Presbyterian Church for about 15 years now. And uh, that's where I'm in Vancouver with a wife and four kids. Nice. Nice. Okay. Well, we're going to get into knowing sin. And I want to start by just reading uh, the, in the introduction, you say that you say few theological topics are as needed in the church today as the doctrine of sin. Christians should know that a proper understanding of grace requires a thorough grasp of sin. A distorted, weak view of sin will lead to a disfigured, anemic, and unproductive theology. I totally agree with that. So what, what compelled you to even broach the subject? There are a few reasons. It, it was probably a combination of factors. One is, as a pastor, I deal with sin a lot with my, my own heart, my family, my congregation, uh, the world. I, I, I coach a lot of soccer teams. So I, I, I'm in the world as well as I'm in the church. And uh, I kind of feel like my training in theology with the Puritans, especially kind of put me in a good position to uh, get into this topic with some theological sophistication and also pastoral application of my own ministry. But also the Puritans were quite good at that. So uh, when I consider also um, the way in which sin is preached on sometimes that I hear it's, it's very general, but I think we need to be more specific about sin, uh, get to the root of sin, diagnose sin, and not just talk about it with vague generalities as though the gospel saves sinners is true, but you know, the gospel also deals with specific types of sins. So it's, uh, it's really a, a number of factors that led me to write the book. Yeah, I um, I actually I was watching an Alistair Begg sermon last night, and he mentioned that the only time we hear about sin today is when it refers to chocolate. So <laughs> yeah. I thought that was I thought that was funny, and it uh, it was helpful, you know, before doing this today. Uh, so before we get into the doctrine of sin and original sin and all the different aspects of sin, where 
when and where and how did sin enter the universe? Just like, let's get basic sin 101. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I have a chapter at the, towards the beginning on, on Satan's fall and um, what I basically speculate a little bit with some theological validation, I ho hope, is that um, there's some early work uh, by Anselm of Canterbury on Satan's fall, and it talks about um, possible reasons why Satan may have, have fallen. I think the usual um, understanding is pride, and there's there's nothing that I would say is, is disagreeable with that, but uh, there may be other factors involved. We don't quite know. Uh, maybe it was the glory that the Son of God would have as the incarnate um, Savior that Satan maybe had a, a, a peek into in terms of God's purposes or other reasons why the devil fell. And so sin enters the universe, so to speak, with Satan's fall. And so in the Garden of Eden, where things are very good, Adam has an intruder into the garden, and he's the, the prophet, priest, and king of Eden, and he's to defend the temple of God and from this intruder. And uh, so the internal cause of Adam's sin was his heart, and that's a mystery to us. But the external cause, um, theologians say, was the wooing of Satan with Adam and Eve uh, in the garden. So sin comes into the world through the devil in a sense, but it also comes into the world through Adam. It just depends on how you're looking at the topic. Yeah. And you, you just mentioned, you know, Adam was a prophet, priest and king in the garden. I, I, that may have been when I read your book, it may have been the first time I kind of heard it in that way. Can you t elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. So uh, he's given dominion over the, uh, over the, you know, he's given dominion to, to make the, the, the earth, um, you know, sort of fruitful, to, to multiply, to be the, the father of other sons of God. Adam is called a son of God, and that's a very kingly title. If you look at the Old Testament and obviously the New, uh, referring to someone as the son of God is uh, a title of kingship. Um, as a prophet, he would have received direct revelation from God and been able to mm -hmm. speak the truth to his wife and to those who would have been born to him. And as a priest, uh, the language for guarding the temple that we later see of priests is a language that's used of Adam when he cultivates and he guards or uh, the garden. So uh, he was one who had access to God. Um, theologians have also speculated a little bit on, on the mediator in the Garden of Eden, and maybe it was the Holy Spirit enabling Adam to have these um, revelations from God through the Spirit. Uh, but we also hear of God walking with Adam, and, and some think of that as a as the Son of God walking with Adam. I'm not against that at all. So um, when you look at prophet, priestly, and kingly uh, titles, duties, Adam seems to fit all of those, and that is why Jesus is the second Adam is also prophet, priest, and king. Right, right, and yeah, and you also say uh, which was, this was the kind of the first time I had heard this too is that Adam basically broke the 10 commandments in the garden yeah. can you run through like what the how he broke those commandments yeah, sure yeah test time um <laughs> I, I i often um ask christians if they even know the 10 commandments because i don't think you can take that for granted today but um the first commandment obviously is to is to put god first and adam put himself first in terms mm -hmm. of desires um, worship. God instituted the proper boundaries for worship, which is the second commandment. And Adam transgressed those proper boundaries by not, um, you know, obeying God's command on how he was to be served. As an image bearer of God, the third commandment isn't just about not saying the Lord's name in vain. In fact, that's a very small part of the third commandment. It's we are image bearers of God, and Adam, as the son of God, was to bear God's image. And so whatever Adam did, implicated God in a certain sense, just as what Christians do implicates Christ in terms of our actions. So when Adam uh, sinned so grievously, he was implicating his father uh, because he was the son of God. The fourth commandment is the Sabbath. And when you look at um, Hebrews 3 and 4, we're told about an eternal Sabbath rest. So Adam jeopardized our eternal Sabbath rest. Mm. He would have had children. We would have entered into a rest one day had he been successful in his period of probation in the garden. So the Sabbath rest was jeopardized. The fifth commandment is honor your mother and father. Clearly, Adam did not um, honor his father. Um, and then the sixth commandment is you shall not kill, which again, uh, death entered the world through one man and death through sin. So death came to all men because all sinned in Adam. 
Uh, the seventh commandment was a little tricky because you you look at the the, the the issue of adultery, but it's not really you shall not commit adultery. Uh, that commandment in its basic form is you also have a duty to love your wife. It's the positive side of the commandment is to love your wife. And he didn't love his wife because he didn't protect her when the serpent was um, beguiling her as the old King James language would have. Um, so then you get to the eighth, you shall not steal. He took from the tree. They took from the tree, which they're commanded not to take. The ninth is bearing false testimony. They allowed Satan's lies to continue in the garden. And the tenth, uh, thou shall not covet, is, is obviously was they took something that wasn't theirs. So um, there's other things you could say, too, about the commandments. But that's why it was so evil, his sin, because it breaks every commandment. Right. And um and so why, and you talk about this in the book, uh, why, and you re-reference Augustine, um, why did God allow sin? <laughs> yeah, uh, in, and that's, you know, there's this Latin phrase, Felix culpa, it's uh, happy guilt. And some have just made the point that, you know, God in his wisdom, God in his vast knowledge of all things decided it would be better to allow sin to enter the world than to draw out of that. Um, the glory of God in a, in a way that otherwise perhaps may not have been um, possible. It's, it's tricky because anyone who's acquainted with sin in a, and really studies what's happened in this world, it's hard to think that um, it is better that sin enter the world. But there's certain arguments like God's mercy may have been wrapped up in obscurity forever if we hadn't have had sin in the world and God's uh, condescending grace in such a remarkable way to sinners. So does it draw more of the perfections of the divine majesty? Uh, some have argued that that is, that's the case. Yeah, I like that. And, and then how did sin affect the Imago Dei? How did it, how did sin affect the image of God in us? Yeah. So, so reformed theologians have said that the, uh, that we're made in God's image. Adam was made in God's image. He was an image bearer and, um, in Genesis 9, for example, verse 6, it talks about, you know, that if you kill someone, basically it's the death penalty. And the, the death penalty is based upon the fact that when you kill someone, you're kill someone made in the image of God. So this is after the fall. It's reaffirmed. And James 3 speaks about how we, you know, praise God and yet curse men who are made in the image of God. So the basic position is um, we are in the image of God still, but it has been damaged. It's been deformed. It's been um, not totally obliterated, but it's still there. And so it's an imperfect image of God. And so what the gospel does is it restores us to the image of God through Christ. So we're predestined to be conformed to the likeness of, of Christ. I like that. Um, and then let's talk about original sin august i mean augustine is the one that the church father who's really known for developing this yeah. idea of, of original sin uh or, or just kind of uh yeah developing it so what what is original sin that doctrine uh kind of develops over time so augustine's version is you know that anyone born into this world is born a sinner uh, and that you know as, at the moment of conception basically uh a, a person is is a sinner and going back to david in psalm 51 but um then it develops over time so you get to the reformation and post-reformation eras the 16th 17th century and covenant theology is becoming a little more dominant and sophisticated and the uh, idea of romans 5 um, as adam as a federal head uh, brings home to us this idea that adam's sin actually made us not just defiled when we are created but it made us guilty before god there's a sort of extrinsic guilt that we have as humanity before God, not just an intrinsic defacing of the image of God because we're born in sin. So there's a sort of forensic idea and there's a, a sort of internal um, problem with us as human beings and both um, are a problem and both have to be dealt with. And so justification deals with the guilt, sanctification deals with the, the power of, of sin, indwelling sin in us. Yeah. And what you talk about, obviously, total depravity, just, I mean, this is kind of obvious, but just what is the definition of total depravity? Yeah, that's a, that's a, um, 
one of the things that came out in the canons of Dort, it, it, it's, it's connected to total inability. And so that's why I don't say that Christians are totally depraved, because um, that would be um, to say that um, they are totally unable to respond to God. So built into the original concept of total depravity is the idea that we are not as bad as we can possibly be, because God in his... Um, condescending grace and common grace to humanity restrains evil in us but it means it's affected every part of our being so our our mind our heart our soul our strength our bodies are affected in some way by sin and so the gospel has to answer to the problem of total depravity which is uh, reorienting our minds our hearts our soul um, to god yeah. And I, you know, I, when I speak at conferences and churches and I get asked about, I get this question all the time <laughs> about being born gay or not. And it, it's it, to me, and I talk about it in my book, it's a moot point because of total depravity, e even our genetic coding is corrupted because of the fall, because of sin. So it doesn't matter if you're, if a scientist discovered a gay gene, let's say today, it, I'd be like, so what? Like yeah. we're even our genetic coding is, is, is fallen. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, so that's, I, and you're right. That's uh, it, it's a complex topic that of course, but you're even, even whatever can be proved doesn't sort of disprove the, the, the reality we're dealing with in terms of the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. And you talk about two, the two parts of sin privation and positive inclination. What is that? Yeah. <laughs> talk about that. So that's a, that's a, it's a, most people wouldn't kind of understand privation if you just ask the average Christian what this means, but it's really important to understand that um, not only do we have a lack of righteousness uh, privation, but we have a positive inclination towards evil in and of ourselves. So apart from the grace of God, our problem is twofold. We lack the ability to do the, the things that we should do, but not only that, we commit the things we shouldn't do. And so privation, when you flesh it all out, um, brings together both those elements, which is how we get the idea of sins of omission and commission. Um, why do we fail to do the good that we should do because of privation, lack of righteousness? And why do we commit the sins we shouldn't commit? And that's also because we have a lack of righteousness, which means we are led necessarily to commit sins and acts of wickedness. Yes. Um, and then you talk about, so, it, you know, I've heard this for years and years. I got saved 12 years ago in Los Angeles where I am, but, um, and I, you know, you hear this in evangelical churches all the time that sin, the definition of sin is missing the mark, Yeah, but I think that definition misses the mark. No. <laughs> so <laughs> what is the definition of sin? What is sin? Yeah, it comes back to what I was just speaking about with privation. You know, you look at the Westminster Shorter Catechism has that great uh, question and answer. You know, what is sin? Is any want of conformity? So it's a lack of conforming to the law of God or it's a transgression against God's law. And then when you look at the vocabulary of sin in the Psalm 51 or other places uh, throughout the, the Bible, you see that it is it's it's wickedness it's evil it's it's lusting it's inordinate it's there's there's different ways to describe it but it really is a failure to keep god's law as well as a breaking of his law and it's always connected to god's law so saying that sin is just means missing the mark is is kind of just a part of the story it's not the full yeah. story yeah, it's, it's, it's part of the story, you know, missing the mark kind of robs it of its, its heinousness. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, oh, I missed the mark. Um, no, you actually, not only did you miss the mark, you shot arrows into all sorts of people and killed them. Right. Uh, right. So if you, it, it's the, the new, the neutrality of missing the mark is something that rubs me the wrong way a little bit. So I think that's why we have to, to really zero in on what sin is in all of its dimensions. Yeah. And you, what, okay. So what, let's talk about indwelling sin. Um, what is indwelling sin and what are the implications for the believer of indwelling sin? Yeah. So John Owen wrote a, a really good um, uh, treatise, volume six. It's quite famous, his mortification of sin. And, and he talks about the Christian's duty is to put to death sin. 
by the spirit. Uh, and so if you, by the spirit, put to death the misdeeds of the flesh, you will live. And so the, the fact that we are saved does not mean that we are sinless. It just now means that sin's dominion has been broken and Christ dwelling in us enables us to mortify, put to death uh, our sin nature. So in dwelling sin, there's a, a bit of a debate, um, I think, maybe on how powerful it is in Christians and whether we can kill it. But however powerful you want to say it is or isn't in a Christian, you can't deny the fact that we are told we can kill it by the power of the Spirit. So at the end of the day, we have to acknowledge that it doesn't have the victory in dwelling sin, but rather we will through Christ. Right. Um, and then you, in one of your chapters, I think it's chapter seven, you talk about, you say that choosing affliction over sin is better. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so there's a, you know, there was a Puritan work uh, on this topic. And um, in terms of, you know, there's more um, evil in the smallest sin than in the greatest affliction. So that Moses is, is one of those examples in Hebrews 11, who, you know, he could have, he could have chosen the pleasures of Egypt and all of that, but he chose rather to be afflicted with the people of God. And um, the, the problem with um, choosing sin over affliction is we forget that affliction has a redemptive value for the Christian, that God is able to work out his purposes through affliction. So Joseph was an example of, of one who, who chose affliction. Christ is an example of one who is the ultimate example of one who chose affliction over sin. So you look at the example of Christ who went to the cross affliction rather than to ever sin uh, which would have rendered his death, um, you know, of no Boy. to anyone. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's something for us as Christians to to fight against sin is to remember that choosing affliction is redemptive. It, it will ultimately be helpful to us, but choosing sin is never in and of itself helpful. God may bring good out of it because of his mercy, but it's not in the abstract a helpful thing to do. Yeah. And what, and what is God, what is God, godly sorrow over our sin godly sorrow is connected with the idea of, of, of sort of evangelical repentance versus legal repentance so godly sorrow is is a sorrow that not only a hating of your sin but a forsaking of your sin and and, and, a, and a, it drives you to communion with god so the idea of sorrow seems a bit foreign to us as a good thing because um we don't want to be sorrowful and yet if you look at the psalmists and um, that is godly sorrow. It's, it's, it's a hatred over just the fact of sin, but it's a hatred over the indwelling presence of sin in our life and what it does to relationships, what it does to our communion with God. And what's amazing is, is we sorrow over how it estranges us from God. And yet that sorrow is what drives us to God. If it is godly sorrow. Yeah. And what are, you talk about secret sins. Uh, what, what do you mean by that? Secret sins are those sins that we sort of, we alone know. Um, those, it's, there's different ways of looking at it. We could talk about secret sins in terms of um, a, a young man looking at pornography on his computer. Uh, but there's also um, secret sins in terms of what we allow ourselves to ruminate on in our minds and hearts. And only God would know besides ourselves that sin. Whereas public sins, maybe me seeing someone the other day, you know, sticking their middle finger out of the window, a driver by getting upset. And there's a, that's a public sin. You know, I see this lady go nuts. Um, that's, <laughs> that's different. She was, yeah, she was, she had all the um, Black Lives Matter, uh, gay pride flag, the get, you know, all of these stickers on the back. So I followed her for a little while out of pure interest. And the next thing she <laughs> on her middle finger out of the window. So I thought, okay, well, man, lesson learned. Um, so yeah, secret sins are, um, they're dangerous because it's really a matter between you and God. And so what, I mean, what's the, obviously repentance is the antidote to secret sin. Yeah. I think secrets secret kind of bringing it out. In the, Cause I mean, I always say, you know, Satan loves to work in the dark and yeah. he, and I, when I talk to people who, you know, are, are struggle with porn addiction or whatever, um, 
I, I always say, you know, bring, bring this out to the body of Christ, like bring this out into the light. So we, we can, yeah. you know, pray for you. We can be, you can be accountable. We can be, you know, so it, cause Satan loves to just keep it secret and yeah. keep it in the dark. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's where we agree with Satan so much uh, in terms of secret sins. It's like, we're holding hands with him saying, this is good. Uh, no, one will know is, you know, and that's the, that's why it's so dangerous. But um, I think secret sins, it's one of the more, uh, I think in a weird way, it can be more of a guilt load than someone who publicly does um, because you kind of feel like there's a bit of hypocrisy going on. And, and I know a true Christian never likes that and ultimately will um, overcome that. But it, I think secret sins can be a greater burden in some respects than than, than public ones even that's what's um remarkable about secret yeah sin. yeah um and what are presumptuous sins presumptuous sins i think would be those types of sins where we just assume or presume upon the grace of god that god will forgive us that this isn't such a big deal so a presumptuous sin to me would be a christian who doesn't think they need the body of christ they don't need to worship each sunday that they would sometimes go to church but it's not necessary so they're presuming upon the grace of god and they're presuming upon them their, themselves to be able to navigate this world and the, and their sin and the and the devil uh, without being fed and nourished by god on the lord's day so that would be an example where a presumptuous sin would be um, saying to god i don't need to do this, I can manage on my own. It's it's sort of the height of self-righteousness, presumptuous sins. And it's also the height of just assuming that if you go in a certain path, God will have to forgive you anyway, because he's God of love um, and that God would never judge you. But when you look at some of God's judgments towards his people and even some of the language of Christ towards his people, it's, it's quite strong at times. Yeah. And, and you, you know, you mentioned forsaking the gathering together. I mean, because of the lockdowns and, you know, it's, it's very tempting because we've been, you know, basically doing online church for one to two years. And so I, I know that a lot of Christians are kind of resistant to going back to the local church yeah. and talk about the, I mean, you, you talked about it a little bit, but talk about the importance of being with the body of Christ uh, consistently and how kind of did this sort of lone ranger sort of Christianity on my computer is, is not really <laughs> a yeah. good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, if you look at the context of Hebrews 10, in my mind, the, the verse before you get to verse 25, where people forsake the assembling of themselves, it's it, we, we gather in order to stir one another up to love and good deeds. So um, one of the reasons for gathering together is, is, is to encourage one another, to stir one another up. And so again, without that, who, who's stirring you up? Who's encouraging you? Who's rebuking you? Um, those are questions that we have to ask ourselves. Are we really that disciplined that we can do all of those things ourselves? And the answer is always a resounding no for me in terms of pastoral care. So, yeah, I think a lot of Christians grew too comfortable at home. And I think it should have been a sense in which if you were um, not able to go to church because of how the pandemic rules were, or whatever they may be, it should have it should have tortured your soul in a certain sense. I mean, I know online church provided a certain benefit and blessing for some who couldn't. But I think there's a sense in which I felt like I had, had something ripped away from me. Yeah, me too. And, and I, you know, when Jesus ascended on high, he gave gifts to men, which is, which is the reverse of what you would expect because normally you, you give a King gifts, but the King gave us gifts, these spiritual gifts for, uh, for the body of Christ. And I feel like if, if you're not with the body of Christ, that's part of how you discover what your giftings are. You know, when people say, Oh, you have, uh, you know, you have such a great gift of, of teaching or you have a great gift of administration or whatever the gifting is. Yeah, yeah. That's where you kind of learn what your giftings are and how you can use those gifts for the body of Christ. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so online, <laughs> online, no one's going to tell you what your giftings are. Yeah, that's for sure. 
Well, they might tell you some other things, though, but that's another story. Yeah. And so back to a presumptuous sins, what I th- can these can these sins lead to? I mean, this is a whole can of worms, but can these sins lead to apostasy? Yeah, I think we have to, you know, I, uh, personally, I, I affirm that any true child of God will persevere to the end. That's a, a belief. But I also know that I don't have total access as a pastor to who is a true child of God. So while I believe that's true and assurance should be something we all strive after full assurance and that I can know I'm going to be with Christ in glory when I die. I think what we also see in the scriptures are that there are some who are in the visible church who start to live a certain life, a pattern develops in their life. It's probably a secret pattern at first coming back to secret sins, but Mm -hmm. then develops into a public pattern. And, and I think Hebrews 10 is quite clear. You know, once you give up the church and you give up Christ, so to speak, there's no sacrifice left for sins, but only a fearful expectation of the wrath of God. And it's a fearful thing to fall in, into the hands of the living God. And that's to Christians, uh, professing Christians, that that letter uh, is being written. Um, so on the one hand, we affirm true Christians always persevere. On the other hand, we acknowledge the church is a mixed body and does include sometimes those who will fall away and it's a tension we have to to balance as as christians and pastors i think yeah and you mentioned in the book you you talk about the solution what is the solution to presumptuous sin the solution to presumptuous sin is to understand that grace is not a mere get off the hook grace is something that you know if you look at the true cost of what it was to save us. Um, you can't presume upon that. That's something that you are, when you truly are grateful for, you you don't treat it with contempt. So I'm truly grateful for my children, for example. It's hard for me to then treat them with contempt when I'm truly grateful for the gift that they are. And I think grace for us is something whereby it should have the opposite effect of making us presumptuous. It should be making us to strive after God more and to be humbled by the fact that he would be gracious and compassionate to us. So that's the irony of presumptuous sins is people think, oh, yeah, you know, God will forgive me. And I go that that grace is not the grace that I've tasted. You know, if you just think you can do whatever you want, the grace I've tasted leads me to the cross, which shows me how evil my sin was to do that, that I wouldn't want to re-crucify, so so to speak, Christ all over again by willfully um, blaspheming his name, which is again, what Hebrews 10, um, tries to pick up on. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's the, the holiness of God is, is so important to, I mean, I think R.C. Sproul was, uh, he wrote a book called the holiness of God, I think. And, um, he really wanted to drive that point home so much. And I think that that's kind of what in contemporary evangelicalism, we kind of lack that (laughs) a little bit, you know, the holiness of God and how, you know, because there is that, there is that um, kind of temptation or notion of, oh, well, I'm just going to give into the sin because I know God's going to forgive me. So it's fine. Like, I don't, I don't need to worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, the holiness of God is, um, I I don't think we can ever really, um, talk too much about it because you know there's a, used to be a time this is before even i think my christian life began where someone was called a god-fearing person uh we don't call people that anymore uh it's kind of <laughs> weird right you're like oh that's a god-fearing person you'd be like oh you know are you from some cult that was quite a normal way to describe a christian at, you know a god-fearing person who had the fear of the lord and and holiness is connected to that so, yeah yeah yeah, maybe, maybe it'll become popular again. I'm I'm not holding my breath on that. <laughs> you never know. Maybe you should write a book on on that. The God uh, your next book. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then on um on page one eleven of your book, you say that uh, after unbelief, nothing more. There's nothing more harmful to the soul than the sin of pride. Yeah. What do you mean by this? I think uh, pr- pride is 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 the is one of those sins besides unbelief that that is really the antith- antithetical to the gospel so what should the gospel do it should make you humble and if you look at the great christ hymn in philippians 2 5 to 11 it's all about christ's humility 
So pride is, is, is actually swapping places irreverently with Christ. Uh, it's putting yourself in a position where you don't think that you are a, a sinner, a real sinner, that you're not in need of grace, that you can make it on your own. And so pride, it's like the higher a, a, a tower goes, um, the easier it is to see it. And the same with our pride, the, 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 the more proud we are, the easier it is for others to see it. It's like um, a balloon that you fill with water and the greater it gets, the easier it is to pop. So I think with pride, that's the, the, the sin that others very easily spot in ourselves when it's present. Yeah. And, um, and then what is the antidote to pride? You talk about this in the book. Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's, there's probably a few. Um, the antidote to pride, I would say antidotes would be, you know, probably better if I was, I don't even know what I exactly say, but I would say, obviously, Christ's humiliation, his life of humiliation, not just his death, but if you look at Christ's life, that the way in which he was treated, the way, the things he did, the, the patience he had, and if you look at what Christ willingly underwent for our, our sakes, it's, it should humble you to the core of your being. Uh, I think God's attributes and majesty are also great antidotes to pride, recognizing we are not like God in the way that God is, is majestic and holy. So there's, there's others, I would say, even just Christian exhortation and, and sometimes rebuke, faithful are the wounds of a friend, that's a good antidote to pride. Mm -hmm. um, and then God allowing us to make a lot of mistakes is a good antidote to pride. So his providence yeah. is helpful there. Yeah. And um, you talk about two, three types of self-love in, in your book. What, what, are the, what are the types of self-love and what you could just explain what that is? So the, there's, there's, there's good self-love and bad self-love. Um, people, I think, misunderstand that at the core of our love to others, we're told love others as you love yourself. And, and there's something good about that. So we should love ourselves in a, in a good way. So a husband who loves his wife, Paul says, loves himself. So the more love I show to my wife, the more love I'm showing to myself. Is that a good thing or bad thing? And I would say it's a, it's a good thing. Um, there is sinful self-love um, in terms of things we do purely for ourselves. And, and I think that is obviously something we would all agree is wrong. There's also self-love in terms of anyone who eats and drinks water and survives is showing self-love. So the natural man shows self-love in a good way. We wouldn't fault a, a child for eating uh, some vegetables. We'd say that's self-love and not sinful. A child who spitefully steals something from someone could do sinful self-love. And then gospel self-love is when we love others in such a way for their sake that we're actually loving ourselves because we're living in the way God wants us to, and God rewards his people. He blesses his people, uh, makes his face to shine upon them when they live in that way. So those would be the various types of self-love. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's like, it's almost the, the, the self-preservation, like when, when we're commanded to love our, our neighbors as ourselves, the second commandment, it's, it's all, it's like that self-preservation that we have for ourselves, mm -hmm. we extend to our neighbor and yeah. that, would you agree with it? That's yeah. kind of the, yeah. 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 You, I think it's just so important to understand that um, we can't lose by you know, when we love others, it's not as though it terminates just on that person. It ultimately terminates on the glory of God. But whenever we live in accordance with how God wants us to, we can't help but benefit ourselves. And in a, in a holy, righteous way, you know, there's ways of looking at how we can just always do things for the sake of ourselves. But the gospel doesn't totally remove that idea. Like I was saying about a husband loving his wife, it's actually in his interest to love his wife rather than not. Mm -hmm. So we need to not be shy about the fact that whenever we live in a way God wants us to, it's going to be good for us. Yeah. And I think uh, social media has exacerbated the bad kind of self-love yeah, <laughs> in this yeah. world yeah. to yeah. such an extreme degree that it's, uh, it's insanity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then you, you talk about the, there are two types of unbelief for 
non-believers. So for the faithless, for, for non-believers, what are these two types of unbelief? Uh, there's, uh, there's unbelief in terms of uh, general, general living unbelief. They ni- neither gave thanks to, like the Romans one is a, is a yeah. very sort of natural theology. Like people just don't believe in the terms of, um, you know, who God is, his invisible attributes have been plainly perceived. And so people just don't believe. And there, then there's a, a formal unbelief where the gospel is presented and people refuse to believe the gospel. So it's more specific to the the word of God, the preaching of the gospel, the proclamation of Christ. And that is a uh, even higher form of unbelief because to whom much is given, much is expected. So when someone disbelieves the gospel in its, its, its form given to us from God, that is a even more grievous sin because Christ is being presented as the salvation that the person needs and that they reject that as well quite apart from just rejecting God in the first place. So it heightens one's guilt, not lessens. Yeah. And you, you talk about that uh, because, you know, and again, in, in, in evangelicalism, there there's, you constantly hear this idea of that all sins are the same, all sins are the same. And, but they're actually not, there's degrees of sin. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I think when you look at just, I mean, even our general law has degrees of sin in society. We understand this It's a basic human idea that uh, a kid who goes into a candy store and steals a a candy because they just, you know, take it is not the same as someone who murders 20 people. So, you you know, the news understands this because of mass shooting and people weep appropriately over things like that because it's, it's so awful. So every human being has to, at some level, understand, there are degrees of sin. That's why we have first degree murder, second, third manslaughter, and so on. In terms of the gospel, this is quite clear. Christ even says, woe to you, Bethsaida and Chorazin. It will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you, because uh, I think that comes back to the types of unbelief. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah, it's, 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 they're not being presented with the Christ of the gospel in the way that Bethsaida or Capernaum or Chorazin, these yeah. places rejected so there's different scales of of sin and um killing someone is worse than slapping them and if anyone denies this principle go up to them and say listen i'm either going to hit you with a sponge or with a hammer which one do you want and they'll they'll say i'll I'll take the sponge um because we understand there are lesser aggravations um so yeah that's that's something that maybe people who just want to who are who've just committed a bad sin, just want to say, Hey, well, all sins are the same. It kind of makes them feel better, but it's a false, it's a false type of assurance. Yeah. And you can even see it in, in the church and in in terms of disqualification of elders or pastors, there are certain sins that disqualify them and, you know, others that don't. (laughs) So, so it's clear just from that, that there's degrees and levels of sin. Yeah, just like there's degrees of responsibility, um, you know, it, you know, teachers in James will be judged more strictly than those who mm-hmm. are regular. Um, there's there's all sorts of different degrees of, of, of sins. And, um, you know, if a pastor commits adultery with another man's wife, it's far worse than a young man looking at a picture too long because yeah. one's a public sin. And one's brought into the other people into the equation and ruined families and, and caused doubt of assurance among many people, perhaps. Right. So I think anyone who thinks about it just for a few minutes would understand that there are degrees of sin. Yeah. And then you, you also talk about, you talk about the two types of unbelief, but then you also talk about the two types of faith in the church. What, what do you mean by that? Oh, I think, uh, no, this is <laughs> I should read my own books. You know that? <laughs> uh, maybe I'll just read it for you. Yeah, yeah. Tell um, me. I, I, I'm pretty sure I know what you're saying, but go, go ahead. I, I can't. Well, actually, Everything I don't. Embarrassment. Yeah. I don't have the page but number, no. so I, it would take me a while to find it. But uh, we we can skip that. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm, I'm actually. I think I think you said that there's two the two types of faith are one is historical faith and uh, yes evangelical yeah so um i I make all these distinctions because i think it's important for theology for us to be precise and then i forget some of these distinctions (laughs) um 
you know, there, there is a, there, there is a faith that people in the church can have. I mean, the parable of the, uh, the very parables Christ speaks of, there's, there, there's a faith that even unbelievers in the church exercise. It's a, it's a historical faith. It's like, I'm a Christian or I, I'm a Presbyterian or, I, you know, and there's the kind of like idea of putting their faith in God. And sometimes so you mean by historical, you mean just like I was raised in a Christian yeah, home kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Things like that. So they can, I, I talked to so many of you, Oh, you're Christian. Yeah. I'm a Christian. You know, I was, uh, this, my, my dad was a pastor and this and that. And they just talk about it in a, a general sense. And then there's a specific looking to Christ. Um, there's a specific renouncing of oneself and receiving freely offered to them the gift of um, Christ. And so that gift of faith, it's supernatural versus a natural sort of believing in God or believing in the Christian church or believing that they're a Baptist. I was raised a Baptist. I'll die a Baptist or whatever it may be. So it's important to distinguish those two types of faith because one is ultimately saving and one is, is, is just non-saving. It's, it's useless. Yeah. It's almost like, you know, one is kind of assenting to the idea that God exists and Jesus, you know, you assent to all those doctrines, but then, but that's, but the, but the other is actually having a real <laughs> supernatural relationship with God, yes. with Christ. So, yeah. Um, and just a couple more questions um oh well actually no this is the the last question i have is sin isn't as you i I think you you mentioned this in the book too sin isn't really talked about that it's avoided in the church so the talk of sin is avoided and i'm i'm so appreciative because when i i happen to come to faith uh, during the first time, I don't know if you know any of my story, but I, when I first yeah. went to, uh, when I first attended a, an evangelical church in my life in Hollywood yeah. 12 years ago, I, the, the sermon was on Romans chapter seven. So it was all about sin. Yeah, yeah. It was all about sin and all about the gospel. And yeah. so the, I, you know, obviously the danger of not talking about sin is that then you don't people don't understand why they would need a savior if they don't really understand the doctrine of sin. Yeah. Yeah. So what what's going on in the church now? Why why are pastors or why are are, are teachers uh, avoiding this subject altogether? There's probably a number of reasons. I you know I I'm kind of I'm one of these guys where I've been to conferences, I've seen conferences, people sit down on chairs and they say, what is the greatest threat facing the church? And you've got to give this pithy answer like there is a greatest threat or <laughs> so, you know, what's the most important attribute of God? And because the conference was on holiness, that's the answer. Right. So I think um, to me, people don't really um, make the gospel as central to their their preaching and don't understand the gospel well and so because they don't understand the gospel well they don't actually understand sin well and then it's flipped so people don't really look at sin very well so they don't understand the gospel well and so which one is it chicken or the egg is it a lack of understanding of christ and who he is and who god is and so we don't really understand sin or is it a lack of sin so that we don't understand christ and i think it's it's just both it's a both and um, people don't really know who God is, his attributes, his, his majesty, his holiness. So they look at each other and, you know, we're not so bad. So I, I get that. But I also, the more I've studied Christ, the more I've looked at his life, the more I've looked at everything of who he is. And, and that was why I wrote a book called Knowing Christ, because it was like as much for me as it was for anyone else. And um, it's the more I actually started to see how, how I'm not like him by nature i'm very much unlike him and that helped me to see my sin because i was able to see christ so well and so i don't think you can really say well we need to see more of this or more of this i think we need to see more of our sin but more of the gospel and as we see more of the gospel in christ we'll see more of our sin and it'll just be a constant rebounding to one another um and that's in- inescapable yeah well, we're, let's leave it there. And guys, the book is Knowing Sin. I highly urge you to to get this book. It's really great. Uh, it's not a you know, it's not a tome. It's a, it's not a long read, uh-huh. but it's really important. And um, yeah, thank you, Mark Jones, for coming on, and Happy Easter. Yeah, yeah thank you, thank you, Beg. It's really great to talk with you. I've uh, I've really enjoyed it, and thank you for reading the book so thoroughly. This is of of all the interviews I've. I've done, I feel like you're, you're probably one of the few who's, who's really like 
uh, read it well and been able to ask the the types of questions that even sometimes <laughs> I can't answer. So well done. I come prepared. I come prepared. Yeah, well, thank you guys. Uh, we'll see you next week on the show and happy Easter again.